Hello and welcome to my video about LEGO's Drone Racers. In this video we'll learn what this game is, is it any good, and why does it even exist? All this and more on today's episode of Abandoned Warehouse. But before we dive into the game itself, we gotta understand why it was commissioned. Similar to Transformers, the sole purpose of this project was to push the sales of toys, which itself isn't a problem, it can provide funding and marketing for some amazing titles. So naturally, LEGO was having a massive ad campaign around LEGO Drum Racers, featuring many both brick and Technic cars, and a variety of propulsion methods, ranging from pullback motors, to slamming a mechanical spring, to full-on RC cars. It was very cool stuff. They had TV ads, a website with games on it, and even an animated movie playing exclusively in Legoland's 4D theater, which we'll get back to later. Now, I remember back in the day spending quite a bit of time on lego.com, just playing all the Flash games that were there, and out of all of them, I remember a specific one very vividly, because it was a full-on 3D driving game, where you drive an RC car in a Lego store at night, and there's a T-Rex sculpture for some reason, and just boxes and boxes of Lego. This is, as I learned, is called Supersonic RC, and is exactly as I remember it from 20 years ago. Now, this lego.com slash racers domain was something that the promotional material was heavily featuring. I know this because I downloaded all the instruction manuals for the lego sets I could find, so I can extract higher resolution images for this video. Now what the hell is this drone? Well, let's learn from the game manual itself. The year is 2015. It's a wired world. And what that world wants is entertainment in ever more thrilling forms. And that's exactly what the Drome offers. Whether you tune in via TV or the net, or travel to the Drome to experience the spectacle of the greatest racing teams in the world, competing across the most hazardous, most extreme range of racetracks ever assembled. There are flying cameras, giant screens, and terraformed landscapes. For spectator and competitor alike, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Squatting at the junction of six 16-lane superhighways, it's impossible to miss the Drome, the Las Vegas of racing, the creation of the mysterious impresario, Dromulus. The roar of the crowds within is only drowned out by the ear-splitting cacophony of the engines. The Drome isn't just a racetrack or several racetracks, it's a city in its own right. Above it all stands the tower, Dromulus's lair and the nerve center of the Drome. As the sun moves overhead, the tall, asymmetrical needle casts a moving shadow across the pit areas at its base, like the second hand of a clock or the marching shadow of a sundial, reminding the teams and the players that every minute they spend adapting their cars is vital to their success or failure in the coming race. Here you can test your driving skills against the very best, where racing is not just winning, but about surviving. The game was published by EA and developed by a British studio called Attention to Detail, funded by University of Birmingham graduates in 1988. They made the Roll Cage games previously and LEGO Racers 2. Sadly, however, this would be their last game, as they went into liquidation the same year due to financial struggles, difficulties with finding publishers and other stuff. There was also a sequel planned at one point called LEGO Racers CC, with more realistic looking cars, but later it was cancelled. So naturally, I intended to play this game on PC, so it would run both natively and being an older title, I could play it at a high resolution and have a nice clean image. Well, this proved to be literally impossible, as the game uses a DRM called Securom that has now been discontinued by Microsoft in the Vista or 7 days, and it also came out in the Wild West of GPUs of DirectX 8.1 era, so even on an XP virtual machine or emulator, I was completely unable to make it even launch. I learned that there are two versions of the game, and you can hack the so-called non-DRM version by changing values in a hex editor of an EXE. I did all that of course, and still got a 3D hardware incompatible error every single time, so I accepted defeat and turned my attention towards the console versions. I chose the PS2 version, as it had more graphical fidelity and features compared to the GameCube version, even though it came out earlier. Sadly, the PS2 version also refused to run with any sort of hardware acceleration, so I had to play it in software-only mode. There's also a Game Boy Advance port that looks nothing like the main game and was built by Mobius Entertainment, now Rockstar Leeds. Which is impressive for the time and the platform, but it's still a 2D game masquerading as a 3D racer. The game has some colorful characters right off the bat, starting off with the player character Max Axel, a young 21-year-old driver who just joined Team Nitro, because of course they're called Team Nitro. 
First off, you're greeted by Chicane, the sassy team mechanic. There's literally a dude called Slot, who is claimed to be the data analyst where you can, you guessed it, save your game progress. A retired race driver called Rocket, who I think is a reference to Rocket Racer in the original 99 LEGO Racers game, and he will give you tips and challenges. So aside from your own team, Team Nitro, there are five other ones. Team R.E.D., H.O.T., Maverick, Zero, and Exoforce. Each of them having a team leader slash racer that you race against. In the same order, Katsu, Exoset, who was in this game renamed Exeta, Rensek, Tag, and Sever, all having very memorable names. And of course, the elusive Dromulus. Jumping into a quick race, you'll immediately notice the action element of the game, found in kart racers such as Mario Kart, or more importantly, the original LEGO racers, which used to be my childhood favorite. There's a total of 8 power-ups in this game you can pick up and they make no sense whatsoever. Let's go through them really quickly. The first one is called Repulsor, it's basically a boost, except it turns your car into a hovercraft and it's impossible to steer. Try to avoid it, it makes you lose the race. Second one is called Hatchet, it does very little damage, it's kinda useless, it bounces around and you can hit yourself with it. Next one is mine, it might be the most useless of them all. Because during my 7-ish hours playthrough I hit the AI maybe like 3 times and I hit the mine myself like once. Uh, the hitbox is extremely small and you can just avoid the whole thing. Even when I thought I was gonna get hit by it, I just went through. The next one is the RC missile, which is the high power homing attack thing. It takes ages to lock on, it does a lot of damage, but it's very frustrating to use and it follows you around for like half the stage before it hits you. There's a blinding one called Flare, it hits multiple races, it's almost useful. But both I can see through it and the AI no problem, so it does nothing to anyone. The shield option is called Disruptor Field, except it's not a shield at all. It just looks like it. It instead just pushes the cars out of the way if they get close to you on the sides. That's it. Next one is the EMP drone. It's kind of like a jammer that stops you from accelerating or using the pickups. This also isn't a very big deal. And the last one is energy pod, essentially health in this game if you take too much damage, your car becomes slower and less responsive, and this is just health pickups. In the career mode you have a list of championships to compete in, called MCRs or multi-challenge races for some reason. In the beginning of each championship or MCR, it's a drag race that just acts as a qualifier, meaning the higher you finish the better your standing position will be. These races I just skipped, I 100% of the game, did every challenge as you'll see later, but these races I couldn't figure out. And to be honest, I didn't want to either. Basically in these MCRs, it's not your average standing that matters, like in modern racing games, but you're finished in the last race. So you can lose the first two races, as long as you win the last one, you win the whole championship. Except in some later ones, if you finish 3 seconds behind first place, you'll start 3 seconds behind them in a rolling start, and some of these are impossible to win. So basically you have to be top 3 in all races, just so you can win the last one. These championships are basically the campaign, and winning them will give you money, which you can spend on upgrading your cars. But because upgrading one car upgrades all of them, these are basically skill points. Another thing you can do in this game is challenges, these will be given to you by Rocket. These both tie in with the gossips, such as this guy was eyeing you on the track, I think he wants to challenge you and stuff. These are one-on-one -on -one races to some intense music on all four variations of a single track, which two of them are just in reverse, and you have to win each single one just to move on. Winning all four will grant you a little bit of money, but more importantly so-called build token. These build tokens are used to build cars in the game, you can choose a tire, chassis, and finally the body and color. Now probably the most important part in any racing game, vehicle handling. And it's not great. Some of it is just poor game design. If you upgrade them enough, they do feel better, but acceptable handling shouldn't be something you unlock like an ability. Cars feel floaty and light, losing traction and spinning out way too easily. They kinda feel like RC cars rather than full-sized heavy machines despite being depicted as the opposite. Off-road surfaces feel nice and bumpy, and this small scale verticality is something that you can't take for granted with off-road racing game. Physics feel alright for the most part, but it takes some serious getting used to, and it didn't help that I had to play on the PlayStation 2 version, and I kept switching between digital and analog mode for the stick and neither felt right. I tested the GameCube version as well, and even though it felt a bit different, it wasn't night and day. There aren't any sensitivity or dead zone settings in the game either, but it does let you toggle rubber banding, which is nice. Another option you don't see much these days. But don't take my word for it, here's what the reviewers from the day had to say about it. As far as actually getting behind the wheel and driving goes, the cars handle a bit squirrely at first, 
and take a bit of practice to get used to. An odd thing is that the road cars are more difficult to drive than the off-road vehicles. They won't completely spin out necessarily, but you'll find yourself facing a wall quite often when you first start playing. Regardless, physics feel floaty, control can be somewhat unresponsive, and there are some collision detection issues. The game's major downside is that it doesn't control as well as it should. The end result is that they're just not as fun to drive as they could and should be. In Wipeout, when a missile is homing in on you, you are filled with a sense of dread and impending doom. In Drone Racers, you just can't help thinking, oh well, never mind, which sums it up nicely. Another promising game struck down by execution. It would have been nice to say that the uninspired design and presentation of Drone Racers are offset by some superbly executed gameplay, but such is not the case. Buy some Legos instead. There just isn't anything exciting about controlling these nondescript racers. Drome Racers does little to encourage the player to return. The collision detection is also rather unfavorable, and regularly sends you spinning for no good reason, and the up to five other racers on the track are always quick to capitalize thanks to numerous boost pads and weapon pickups. Ultimately, we're quite confident that, like us, you'll decide that you've much better things to do with your time. Drome Racers may be inoffensively put together, but we still find ourselves struggling to grasp why it was commissioned. Drome Racers is one of those games that is interesting, but you should probably skip it. Without the LEGO branding, probably not many people would have played it, as it is extremely forgettable and both frustrating and boring. Plus, you gotta remember that most of what I understood of the story, not that it matters in a racing game, was from other sources of media. Hell, even the game's own intro and cutscenes were lifted from the 4D movie. That's where the flying drone is from with googly eyes. The game was probably rushed in development, but there are no cutscenes, it's just races and the garage. You really do only get the whole picture if you watch the animation, visit the old website, read the manual, etc. Which I was able to do thanks to archive.org's Wayback Machine and a project called Flashpoint that let me play the Flash games. This video has taken me way longer than I expected, over 50 hours, with all the recording, researching, everything, so if you enjoyed, please do hit the buttons below, and I hopefully see you again next time. My favorite part of Mobius Entertainment was when they said, It's Mobin time! And they mobed all over the game.